lot of community interest in starting a butterfly garden here in Margate. They're great, they're a lot of fun. Um, my granddaughters adore mine when they come over. And so hopefully I'll be able to give you some new information and some of it you may know already. I have my back to you, you wanna come? No, nope, I'm fine. You're okay? Yep. <laughs> That's not my best time. <laughs> <laughs> I would pay attention to the screen. <laughs> okay, I did bring a lot of handouts for you here today. Um, I am the outreach coordinator for Nature Scape Broward, and I do have some of those flyers here. I also have these fantastic native wildlife brochures for you. Um, if you haven't picked it up, you will definitely want one of these. This is the native larval host plant, and I will talk about nectar and larval plants today. This is about gardening for wildlife, and I'll also speak about that later on in the program. I was told that there was interest in planning a community garden, so I brought a lot of things from the University of Florida and also from Nature State Broward on plants that attract birds and butterflies and different layouts if you were doing a small six by six garden, if you were doing a bigger garden, and they're only meant to kind of give you ideas. There's nothing rigid in, in butterfly gardening. One of the things that is helpful is a spacing chart for a, people that don't know that when you buy a plant and it's kind of small and you walk around the yard with it looking for a place to, <laughs> to put it in, you have to think about how big it's going to be later on. So the spacing chart will help you as well. Let's see. Now, how many of you are native Floridians? Okay, no. <laughs> not one. one. <laughs> All right. So you've seen the land use changes Absolutely. over the years. People that come here from other places, like myself, I was on Cape Cod before I came down here, don't really understand how unique South Florida is. This is a picture of the Everglades, and at one time, everything from Lake Okeechobee down to Miami from the east coast to the west coast after the ridge that comes down 95 was all Everglades. <coughs> so this, what we have here is all artificial. Everything was drained off in order to have agriculture. So we've had some uh, real land use changes down here. I remember when I first came down and got married, I was looking at different houses around and the realtor took me around she says, oh, this is a waterfront property. And I said, oh, coming from Cape Cod, I was all excited. And then she showed me a house that had a drainage ditch in the back. <laughs> and I said, excuse me, this is waterfront property? And she says, oh, yeah. I said, it's a drainage canal. But you can pay extra for that. <laughs> so how do we get from this to this? How many of you have read Marjorie Stoneham Douglas' River of Grass? It's a great book. It's a great historical perspective on Florida. This is another book. If you've read that one, you'll love this one. This was called The Swamp, and um, it more, gets into more of the political process of what happened in order to get everything drained off. So as you can see, this is what Florida used to look like, and now this is what we look like. So we've gone through some land use changes here. You can see um, Lake O, and where is my little pointer, is it not working? There it is. So you can see Lake O, and these are the canals that go east and west, and also come down here, this is up in Belglade and stuff, where all of the water is diverted here where we live, to us. So all of this other area, the water has been changed. So here, we have all of this housing where we used to have Everglades. So why would that affect us? It's gonna affect us and it's gonna affect our water supply because we get our drinking water from our groundwater. We get it from the aquifer, which runs underneath the ground. Here in Florida, all of the trees have their roots in the first up eight inches of the soil because after that, you get down into our water table. Our water table is very high. So what we do, what impacts we have with fertilizers and with pesticides 
that go down into that ground and get flushed down into that groundwater all affect our drinking supply. So you can see how built out we are here. Actually, Broward County is pretty much built out sideways. Now you see everything going up higher and higher. But everybody poops, so everybody's going to be drawing on that water supply, and that water supply is limited. So what we do to protect our water is important. Habitat impacts. We have adverse habitat impacts, we have invasive exotic plant materials, and we have beneficial native plants. Native plants help to balance our ecosystem. And as I said to you, everything out here is artificial. So everything that we do to try and make it more natural is going to be more beneficial to our wildlife, including our butterflies. Now, there are invasive plants and there are non-invasive plants. Primarily, the native plants are not invasive, though there are some native plants like cattails that if they're in a mitigation area are required to be taken out even though they're native because they push out the native plants and you end up with just one variety of monoculture which is not healthy. So you want to try and plant the native plants whenever you can and some people say, well, you know, they're not as pretty as the invasives, and, and sometimes they're not as showy, but certainly you can find an alternative. This is Wedelia on the left. This is still sold. It's invasive. It's a Category 2 invasive exotic. Uh, I planted it in my yard when I first came to Florida because I thought it would be nice to hold the bank from erosion. Great idea, but a Category 2 invasive plant. An alternative might have been the dune sunflower on the other side, which is native and non-invasive. Everybody sees these at all the box stores, the Ruelia. Don't buy them. Don't encourage your neighbors to buy them. They are like the little shop of horrors. When they get planted in the ground, they just take off. I also planted this in my yard years ago when it first was offered. Thought it was great. Blooms in the shade, grows everywhere. Oh grows everywhere. That's the thing. An invasive plant has to do with the growth rate of the plant, how it's going to just take off and spread out and take over our natural areas. Now we do have a native variety, a wild petunia. Um, it's got a, a little bit of a different flower on it, a little bit leggier, but if you wanted that color for some reason or another, um, you could go with the Florida native. This lantana is a category one invasive. Very, very bad, very, very bad. But we do have a native lantana, the white one. And the butterflies will go to both of them, but the white one is the better choice. Now, the Christmas cassia, the senna, is a native exotic, but the Bahama cassia is a Florida native. Very similar looking plant. This is an excellent plant for the sulfur butterflies. Porterweed, when you go for the porterweeds, you will find that um, most of the stores will have this one. This one's taller, you'll be pruning it all the time to keep it down, okay? This one is the native. It grows a little bit more prostate, doesn't come quite up as high, um, less pruning, preferable plant. A little bit harder to find them sometimes, but the box stores are going to sell what you ask for. And if you don't buy the other stuff and you keep asking for something else, then eventually they're going to come around. <clears throat> but there are a lot of native nurseries around that you can get this plant material from. So some people have a very weird idea of what having a wildlife preserve is. We don't want to confine our wildlife into different areas. What we want to do is preserve them for future generations, for our grandchildren and their children. So attracting wildlife is important to help maintain that ecological balance. This is our state butterfly, the zebra longwing. What it is perched on is called Spanish needle. And it's a uh, plant that a lot of people think is just a weed. It will spread a bit in your yard. They love it. The bees love it. 
Um, if you have a little spot in your yard where you can let things grow a little bit wild, let it go there. It's a wonder, wonderful plant for pollinators. So what we're trying to do, yes? Is that that one that has those little sticky things that end up sticking out on your clothes and stuff? No, I don't no. think, I don't think no. so. Not this one. No. no. Okay. But I know what you're talking about. I think you, uh, I think the native porterweed, the white one does that, has those little white it sticky little things. It looks a lot like that flower, like, I mean, they're small, and then it has those little, like, they're about yay big, and they, like, if you're walking through them, they stick to your clothes. Yeah, not not not, a, not on this one. Oh, so okay. that would that would be a different one. But that's how you know that's how they procreate, get right. transferred. Some things get by wind, some by pollination, some by hitchhiking. <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to incorporate these wildlife habitats <laughs> into our urban design. We want to extend that food chain. Talking about that food chain, um, don't cringe, but the butterflies and the caterpillars are an important food source for our migratory birds as well, especially when it's nesting season. So there is a percentage of them that's going to get whacked, but if you plan enough for them, they are going to be helping, the, you're going to be helping the butterflies and you're going to be helping the birds. And that's why I brought also the handout on plants that attract uh, the birds as well. So we want to provide this nesting and roosting habitat for our native and our migratory birds as well as uh, butterflies and other wildlife. So why would we want to do that? Well, we want to be able to connect our kids with the outside world. I have two granddaughters, and um, if they had their way years ago, they would have sat on the couch watching the videos all day long and, and playing with the uh, iPads and all of their stuff. But when they come over to my house, they don't even bother taking them anymore. This Grammy, 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 can we go see where the butterflies are sleeping? Grammy, can we go feed the fish? Grammy, can we do this, can we do that? They're all outside, they love it. And they've now been volunteering out at Markham Park at the butterfly garden out there. So at least I uh, made a connection somewhere. <laughs> so we want to do things for our loss of wildlife. We're losing a lot of wildlife and the primary reason is that habitat loss. So we want to take that fragmented habitat and now uh, try and connect it for the wildlife. When we're talking about that water supply underneath the ground being very important, all of those areas where we had water before where migratory birds came down, so, well, there used to be a, a pond here, or there used to be some trees here. There were places for me to rest and drink, and now there isn't. So that river of grass, that Everglades that we had, every time it rained, that water would flush through that river of grass and go down into the aquifer. It would be purified of all the pollutants and the water was clear and fresh. And if you think of that aquifer beneath the ground as a giant sponge that's holding our water, which then we, we draw from. So as we've developed and we have a CVS on every corner, and a Walgreens on every corner, and a Publix, and a Winn-Dixie, and uh, three-car garages, and community centers, and parking lots. What have we done? We have put a layer of cement over that giant sponge. So now, when it rains, the water comes down, hits that pavement, runs off, goes into the storm drains. Storm drains go into the canals. Canals go out to the ocean. So we don't have the ability to store a lot of that water like we used to. So we have a degradation of our natural resources and also soil erosion. Your, your plantings will help for all of those things. So a naturescape is just simply Florida-friendly landscapes that conserve water, because water is very important to us, reduce pollution, the reduction of the pesticides and the fertilizers, creating habitat to attract native and migratory species. So it's really easy to have a naturescape, and I believe the gentleman in the back said his yard is certified as a naturescape. Anyone else? Yours? Anybody else certified? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. So this is a kaleidoscope of migrating butterflies. Just as we have birds migrate through, the butterflies also migrate. But speaking about birds, we have some distressing statistics here. Nearly 20% of all the wetland birds are on a watch list. Wetland loss has accelerated by 140% since 2004. So what does that mean? We are here along this Atlantic Flyway. Wait, did I have, I 
don't have that little slide. Here we are on the Atlantic Flyway. So we are on a, a huge migratory bird path here. We also have three other major migratory flyways in the uh, U.S. And a lot of these birds, and someone was speaking of the hummingbirds earlier, hummingbird is the state bird in Colorado. It migrates down that central highway over to the Mississippi Flyway, over to the Atlantic Flyway, comes down to Florida, and doesn't stay here. From Florida, it goes across the Gulf into Mexico or out into the Caribbean. So I don't know about you, but when I take a flight from here to Massachusetts or from here to the Midwest or if I was going all the way to California, I'm exhausted and I wasn't flapping my wings the whole way. <laughs> so you have all of these birds that are migrating. They get here and they go, okay, what happened? Where am I going to get my drink of water? Where am I going to rest? Where am I going to juice up? So you need those nectar plants for those hummingbirds. So they get that added boost of sugar to get them out off of that last leg. Uh, here's the slide I was looking for. So uh, over one third of our common land bird species have declined more than 15% since 1970. 46 species have lost half or more of their populations. This is a net loss of over 1.5 billion breeding birds. So when people say to you, geez, you know, I just don't see as many birds around as I used to, one of the major reasons for that is the habitat loss. This is the green infrastructure map for um, Broward County. And it, goes, it was done in 2010. We just got funding to redo the data on this uh, in 2018. But don't get excited over this green because the color on here is not great. This is not 40% or higher. This is 20 to 39%. And these areas here in the lighter green are 0 to 19% tree canopy. And that includes Margate. So we have this hole here in the central corridor of Broward County that we would like to replenish with more trees to increase that tree canopy in that hole. Now, I was hoping when we got this funding that I was going to show a really big increase of canopy trees from 2010 to now. But Irma, who was our unwanted guest recently, knocked out approximately 1,800 trees just in our parks in Broward County. So we've got one step forward, two steps back. So it will be interesting to see what's happening there. The county is in the process of redoing the brochure, Gone with the Windstorm. And in that brochure, which I should have in a couple of weeks, and I'll be happy to bring some here to park so that you guys can pick them up afterwards, is going to tell you which trees don't perform well in hurricanes and storms and which ones do. So uh, that will be a helpful resource for you. And as soon as I have them, I'll bring them to you. So habitat loss is going to be the main cause of decline of butterflies and moths. So our land management techniques are worth having a, an impact. Uh, intensification of farming and forestry, industrial development, and of course, climate change. So the concept is to have these movement corridors, to have these different areas of landscapes, whether they're in the park, and then to your home, and then to the next person's home, so that every quarter of a mile, we have a refuge. And then we have this movement corridor. So the birds, the butterflies, will be able to jump and move along and get their uh, food and, and water and places to have rest. So butterfly habitats can be all types of habitats. They get special butterflies that are in mangroves, special ones in lowland forests, ones that go to sand dunes, wetlands, mountainous regions, grasslands. They're all going to have different types of butterflies in those habitats. Rocky areas and bare ground give them a place to lounge in the sun. They are solar powered. They are going to need some sunlight. So how are we going to track them? We need to do four things. We need to have food for them. We need to have water for them. We need to have cover and places to raise young. So here's the main concept with butterfly gardening. If you don't get anything else, there are two types of plants that you need to have. You need to have a nectar food and you need to have a larval food. 
A nectar food is going to be any of those tubular flowers that they can put their proboscis down into and suck out that nectar. You don't have to memorize a million different plants. If it's got a red or an orange tubular flower on it, they're going to like it. The bigger the flower, the bigger the butterfly or hummingbird that you will attract. But I do have the list of plants there for you that will help to make it a lot easier for you. So if you have nectar plants like Pentus, which is an excellent nectar plant, Firebush, excellent nectar plant, if you have those in your yard, you're going to get butterflies. They're going to come in there, they're going to drink. But it's like going to a fast food place. It's like going to McDonald's. You go to McDonald's, you go in there, you get something to eat really quick. I go to McDonald's, I'm in a hurry if I'm there, right? I grab what I need. I usually have my cheeseburger eaten before I'm out of the parking lot. If, I'm, if that's where I am, I'm starving. <laughs> so I'm eating it, and then I'm gone. But if you want mommy butterfly to hang around, then you have to plant more than the nectar plants. You have to plant the larval plants. The larval plants are what her caterpillar is going to eat. And each butterfly is host specific, will only lay her eggs usually on one plant, sometimes more. If you wanted to attract monarch butterflies, you would plant milkweed. That's the only place that she is going to lay her eggs. So. If she sees that in the yard, and you've got the pentas, now that's like going to a family restaurant. That's like saying, oh, OK, I can sit back and have a drink while my kids eat their chicken fingers and mac and cheese. Because when my granddaughters were young, that's all they ate, chicken fingers and mac and cheese, and that was it, right? So everybody's got their food preference. But mommy says, oh, look, I have a place to raise my young. I have a place to rest here. I've got some sunshine. I've got a little puddling station of water. I've got the nectar plants. I've got everything I need. I'm hanging around this yard. There's no need for me to go to the next McDonald's, right? I'm going to hang around here. So those are the two things. And you have this flyer, which I can never keep these in my office. Everybody uh, comes in for these. These are native larval host plants and the butterflies that they attract. So this is great because it shows you what the caterpillar looks like, shows you what the butterfly looks like, and tells you what plant if you want to attract that particular butterfly. So this is a, a really cool and handy dandy thing that you can take with you. Because hopefully, besides doing the butterfly garden here, you're going to want to do it at home as well. So these are native plants that provide nectar. And most of them are all tubular flowers, right? We've got the coral bean, the tropical sage, that salvia. I love that plant. It's a great plant. Uh, the porter weed, which we talked about earlier. The coral honeysuckle is lovely. It's a vine, very, very pretty. The firebush, if you don't plant any other shrub in your yard, plant the native firebush. The mist flower, that one will come up in your yard if you have a wet area. It's a native wildflower. Therefore, must be a weed because I didn't plant it there, right? I'm going to pull, <laughs> go pull it up. I have a friend of mine in Garden Club that drove all the way to the Keys to get one plant that she knew was a larval food for the malachite butterfly, that lime green butterfly. And after searching for months for a nursery that had that plant and she got down there and bought it, she realized it's what she'd been pulling out of her yard for years. <laughs> so. <laughs> Here in her yard, it was a weed. But at the nursery, it's got value. So here, this is, again, the corky stem passion vine and the incense passion vine. The corky stem passion vine really has an insignificant flower on it. The incense passion vine is a little bit bigger. Some of the other showier passion vines that you get, like the red ones, if they don't like them, don't, don't plant the red one. But if you planted this corky stem passion vine or this incense passion vine, all three of these butterflies lay their eggs on it. So this is a win-win situation. You will get the zebra long wings, the gulf fritillary, and the julia butterflies will all be laying their eggs there. Plus, they will be getting the nectar from the flowers added attraction gets little berries on this on this corky stem the birds will love that the hummingbirds will love the firebush so you've got your there's a whoops there's the firebush 
So you've got that tubular flower on the fire bush, and then it gets seeds afterwards. So you're, you're helping out more than one species. You're helping out the butterflies, the hummingbirds, and the migratory birds. Now, there are two fire bush for sale. If they tell you it's a dwarf fire bush, don't get it. For one thing, there's no such thing as dwarf plant in Florida. And the other thing is it's not the native. It's a little more orange. Um, so you want to make sure you get the native plant when you can. It's much better. Use plant combinations. Now, this plant here is a kunti. The um, Native Americans used to grind the roots of that to make arrowroot to, make, uh, to bake with. So this was a major source of income for the pioneers when they were down here. But that kunti plant is the larval um, food for a rare and endangered Atala butterfly. It's a small little butterfly. The caterpillar is really cool. It's red and with little yellow dots on it. Now, this butterfly garden that you have here, if you plant this in it, if you have dogs, the seeds from this plant can be toxic to dogs. So you want to be careful. My dogs have never bothered any of my plants in the yard except for that new rescue dog I got two years ago. So I had Kunti in the backyard. I took it out because I couldn't trust Remington. I do have it in my front yard where he's not off the leash. So I have it there and I have a colony of Atalas there. But I don't keep it in the backyard because of Remington. But you can monitor it. You can go out there when you see the seed cones on it. It's only the seeds that are poisonous. You can just cut the seeds off and take them out. But just as a heads up, you might want to put a little sign, seeds of this plant are poisonous to dogs, just in case it's some place that people take their dogs. Uh, this is the bloodberry. This here, it's a uh, butterfly sage. The butterflies are going to like it, and so are the birds are going to like it for the seeds. And as I say, when the birds are nesting and they're feeding their babies, even if they're normally seed eaters and don't usually eat insects, they will eat insects then. They need that extra protein. And there have been studies by Audubon when there's a lack of insects, there's a lack of nesting, there's smaller clutches of the birds, uh, and uh, the birds aren't as healthy. Now these are native plants that provide foliage and twigs. Those zebra long wings love the twigs. And the thing about the zebras are they're a social butterfly. They'll go off for six miles during the day, but at night they'll come back to the same place to roost. So if you have some twigs hanging in your fire bush, you'll see them all hanging and draping down in a cluster at night. And that's what my granddaughters just love. They love to go out there around 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, just at dusk when they're all coming back. I have some live Tillandsia Spanish moss in the trees, and they just cluster and hang down them. And they come back to the same spot all the time. It's really cool. But live oaks, red bay, wild lime. So the live oak is also a larval food. So some people think that butterfly gardens are just fruit fruit little plants, but there are trees that can be incorporated into your butterfly gardens in your yard. The wild lime is great for the swallowtails, that corky stem passion vine, of course, the zebra. There's the swamp milkweed, which is our native milkweed, but it needs to be kept wet. There's your monarch, water hyssop, kunti, bahamacassia. So all of those plants attract those specific butterflies. And you're videoing this, right? So they'll be able to, so you'll be able to access this again, um, I believe later, because the, the city is videotaping this for you. Okay, the strangler fig, our native fig, uh, is also a larval host food uh, for the ruddy dagger wing, which is, you can tell this one differently from the others because you can see how they have this little extension in the back. The wild lime for the giant swallowtail, her uh, butterfly caterpillar kind of it's camouflaged to look like bird poop so that the birds will stay away from it. This does have thorns, so if you have a spot in your yard that's in the back somewhere, or if you're incorporating it into your garden, you put it in an area maybe surrounded by some other things. 
Uh, again, there is the Italo butterfly on the Kunti. The thing that I love about the Kunti and the landscape, and you don't have to have your butterfly garden at home in one spot. If you incorporate these plants throughout your 